All right. So uh, we've all done our introductions. Congratulations for joining the program. I think that you guys will find that this structure is is going to work very well for you, especially you, Chris and Tim, uh, uh, given the experience from the past uh, group. I mean, the material and the content was great. Uh, we just need to be able to maintain a, um, a structure, right? So I'm going to talk about that structure. We're going to go through this 13-page uh, PDF because I want to make sure that you guys are completely, uh, you understand how this mentorship program is going to work and what the goal of this program is. And what I've done is I've kind of outlined specific topics that we're going to cover throughout this particular program. Our goal today is to cover uh, the mentorship topics, uh, particularly the first two bullet points, the, the program introduction, which I'm about to do, and then what you guys sh should expect to see in the CCIE routing and switching, not only from a written perspective, but also from the um, from the lab perspective. What topics are going to be included, what topics are not included, and so on. And you've identified, there is a small mistake here, the changes, that's a little bit, going to be a little bit longer than half an hour, but um, not much. All right, so what I've done is I've kind of broken down the topics of this particular program uh, to identify what our objective is regarding the, the different program elements. Uh, and we'll try to, and, and this is kind of in a chronological order, actually. We've, I've, I've kind of outlined this as part of a, the chronology of the program as well. And uh, the focus, as you can see, is going to be on routing and switching. It is the CCI routing and switching. But if you look at the, the distribution of switching topics versus routing topics, it's a pretty big difference, right? About 21 and a half hours of switching topics that we're going to cover and about 122 hours 123 hours of routing topics that we're going to cover. Uh, now, one of the things that I did with this particular uh, outline is I took all of the topics, I kind of came up with a, an outline of what I wanted to cover for each of these topics, uh, and I doubled the time. So uh, it may not take 21 and a half hours. It may not take 122 and a half hours to cover these topics. It just depends on how the discussion goes between the group members, if you have additional questions. None of these topics are scripted. Uh, every one of these topics are ad hoc. Uh, I think that's uh, uh, kind of the best way to learn uh, about, uh, there's gonna be about a 30 to 70, 30 slash 70 uh, percent ratio between uh, theory and elements of configuration versus the actual hands-on configuration. So, uh, you know, for each one of these, there's a very heavy component of configuration uh, and heavy component of troubleshooting and uh, just d exploring and discovering each of these particular topics. My goal, of course, is to get you guys to the point where you can take your written, but the primary focus of this mentorship program is to get you prepared uh, so that you can go and sit the lab and and get through the lab the first time so we're going to start with doing a land switching introduction uh, we'll t we'll then move into the vlans and switching topics which is uh, that the introduction to that topic is about two hours and then we'll get into vtp another two hours uh, vtp version three that's what that's supposed to say there that's a that's a typo uh, so this, this uh, bullet point here, this one and a half hour topic is uh, the differences uh, that we expect to see with VTP version 3. Then we'll get into some ether channel discussion, about two hours of uh, introduction to ether channel. Uh, and again, these all com con uh, include configuration elements, right? And I'm going to talk about how the program is set up uh, that provides us the ability to do these configurations and, and participate in these configurations uh, as a group together. Uh, layer two ether channel about an hour and a half, layer three ether channel about an hour, and you might be looking at that and going, wait a minute, why, why would it take us an hour and a half to talk about layer two ether channel? It's a very simple topic. But the point here is that you're not, we're not doing CCNA slash CCMP level discussions here. Uh, we are doing CCIE level discussions, which includes a, a lot of detail in how these algorithms work, how these protocols work, how the configurations work, and then, in, uh, you know, additionally, how do I 
how do I apply expert level troubleshooting techniques to these particular programs? So it's, it's, a, it's to these particular algorithms or, or applications. So it's really important that we do these deep dives uh, into each of these topics because when you get into the lab, you don't have the opportunity to figure things out, right? And what I mean by that is you don't have the opportunity to use context sensitive help and kind of fiddle around and fart around with different configurations. You have to pretty much do everything from muscle memory. I took the lab three times uh, and uh, the first time was a completely raw experience for me and basically in my first time, uh, which was version four, I basically just learned or, uh, you know, learned the process, not, not uh, you know, how it felt to be in that environment, that high pressure environment, you know, uh, just, just kind of just learning about what the process was like. And then when I took it the second time, uh, it was version five. And of course that went completely virtual. So the topology was much, much ro more robust. Uh, you went from maybe 10 different devices in a physical topology to 20 or 30 devices in a virtual topology. So that was a little bit overwhelming, but um, you know, and then finally the third time I made it through. But so the, my experience in all three, the one thing that I came away with with that experience was you cannot spend time trying to figure something out. Uh, it, it, you almost have to be able to react to these scenarios and these situations. And we're going to talk about as part of this document, how the, how the struct, how the lab is structured and so on. Um, but that's why we have so much time dedicated to each of these topics. Now it might not take an hour and a half. Uh, like I said, I kind of estimated on the high side for each of these topics, but, uh, you know, that's our goal. And so what we're going to do as we move through the program is we're going to say, okay, today we're covering these topics and our goal is to kind of get through those topics. And then the takeaway from that particular lesson uh, is, okay, what are we going to cover in our next session? These are the topics we're going to cover in our next section. And then I'm going to provide you guys with, I've got a, um, a, a Google Drive folder set up. Let me pull that up real quick. Um, uh, hold on one second. I've got a Google Drive uh, folder set up, which I'll share the link to you guys. You guys will want to bookmark this. I'll just drop it in the chat window real quick. Um, called CCIE Routing and Switching Mentorship. And everything related to this program is going to go into this Google Drive folder. Uh, and um, all the live lesson recordings we're going to publish. Uh, every switching topic, uh, so within the switching topic folder, I'll be creating subfolders for each topic that we're going to be discussing throughout the program. Uh, and what I'm going to be doing is saying, okay, next Wednesday, we're going to cover these two topics. So I'm going to go into that folder before next Wednesday, and I'm going to put in all the reading material that I think you guys should read through, or if there's some videos or something like that that, that, that will help you prepare for the lesson, I'll put that stuff into that folder so that you have some material to review in the times that we're not doing lessons uh, so to prepare for the next lesson. So this is a mentorship program, which means that there's a lot of work that I have to do to make sure you guys are prepared, but there's a lot of work that you guys are gonna have to do on your own to also prepare yourself as well. So we'll, we'll uh, have a, a written section here for those that need to take the written exam. Uh, if you guys have done my classes before, it'll be a VCE type scenario where I provide you a VCE file and you'll go through and you'll um, prepare for the written exam by reviewing that, that VCE file. Uh, switching topics, then routing topics, and, and this will continue to build throughout the program. We'll continue to add more and more, uh, um, but you guys will have this, uh, this link. In fact, let me see if I can't uh, go ahead and share that link with you guys real quick. It's not posted yet. Um, I'll, I'll get that link to you guys before. It, I'll, I'll just email it to everybody so you guys have it in email. So that link will be uh, the link that will be active for the entire uh, program process. All right. Um, that being said, let's continue on with the topics here. So ether channel, spanning tree, uh, big topic, right? 
uh, from a switching perspective, probably the most complex topic. Uh, so we've got two, four, six, eight hours of spanning tree that we're going to talk about. That actually might go up. Spanning tree is a little bit more complicated than, say, ether channel, so we might spend more time. Uh, these, are, these timelines are goals for each of the topics, but it may extend beyond that time. Sometimes it might be less. And then uh, we'll focus on some WAN stuff as well, PPP over, uh, PPPoE. Uh, their uh, frame relay has been removed from the lab. Uh, MPLS has been put in its place. Um, and we do talk about MPLS, but MPLS is kind of layer two and a half. So we didn't really put it into the switching section. We put it into the routing section. Obviously, routing is going to be the biggest focus of this particular class. Uh, six and a half hours of general routing introduction, uh, which, and these sections are bolded because uh, this six and a half hours is accumulation of all the topics that are under, under this category. So we don't have six and a half hours plus these. This six and a half hours is a total of the hours that are included under general routing topics. EIGRP is 19 hours, uh, and you can see OSPF, uh, pretty extensive, 31 hours of OSPF and so on. So we'll be talking about each of these topics. I'm not going to read every single one of these, but our goal essentially is to do this chronologically, to say, okay, now we're going to move into the general routing topics. Our next session is Wednesday. We're going to dedicate three hours or four hours to that session. So we should be able to cover IPv4 routing and policy-based routing in that time frame. All right. Uh, and that way you guys know what we're looking to do as part of that program or as part of that session. You can prepare for that session by doing some read ahead. Video, uh, I'll provide videos and so on that I, can, that I can provide that are related to the topics and so on. All right. We'll move into, uh, so we're going to be talking about IPv4 routing, basic general concepts, policy-based routing, IPSLA, enhanced object tracking, GRE, IP tunneling. Not a big component of GRE on the lab uh, or uh, IP tunneling, things like um, IPv6 and IPv4 tunneling, but it is covered on the written. Uh, EIGRP obviously is going to be a big component of the lab. Uh, classic EIGRP, named EIGRP. So there you go. Those are, those are the, the topics that we'll be chronologically discussing as we go through the, the program itself. Then we'll move into OSPF. OSPF will be another 31 hours uh, or so of, of lessons. Uh, and these are the individual topics that we'll be covering uh, with OSPF. All right. You'll notice that most of these topics at the most, the topic is going to be two hours. Uh, the reason why I did that and I broke it up that way is because I, uh, we're doing these sessions in conjunction with every, all the other responsibilities and whatnot that you guys have from a day-to-day -day basis. So we're trying to segment these sections to provide you, number one, the ability to focus on one thing in an individual group session that might be two hours or three hours or four hours. Uh, and number two, because it's broken up and the sessions are kind of split up in between, it's going to give you the opportunity to do all your own pre-study uh, and pre-preparation for each of these topics as we go through the process. Some of them might not have any pre-study or pre-preparation. Some of them might. I might give you a document and say, here's the SRND for OSPF. Read this section of the SRND uh, in preparation for this discussion and the next time around or whatever. Okay. So these are the OSPF topics. Then we're going to spend about 11 hours talking about DMVPN, uh, uh, you know, basic configuration, what are the differences between phase one, phase two, phase three. Uh, every one of these discussions will involve some sort of physical configuration. Uh, we'll talk about how we're going to uh, handle the configuration aspects. Route redistribution, uh, we'll talk a, a lot about that, seven hours about route redistribution. Uh, and then BGP, 28 hours. So BGP and OSPF are really the core components of the route switch process, right? There, there, there are, when it comes to the CCIE, especially for the lab, you have core elements, and then you have these ancillary elements like optimization of routing, PFR, you know, uh, bi-directional forward, whatever. Uh, 
you have all these separate little topics that are most likely going to be covered on the, the, the written and not so much covered on the lab. But on the lab, there's a lot of focus on core technologies. So BGP, OSPF, EIGRP. Uh, so that's why we dedicate a lot of time to those particular topics in this particular program. Uh, finally, we'll uh, wrap up by doing uh, uh, routing optimization, uh, looking at things like BFD, uh, FRR, LFA, uh, MPLS is another 11 hours that we'll be going through uh, discussing MPLS. Uh, MPLS is more heavily covered on the written than it is on the lab but it is important for you to understand because you may have in the troubleshooting section or in the diag section you might have questions related to uh, the MPLS piece and we'll, uh, as part of this discussion I'm going to talk to you guys about how the CCIE program is structured and why it's important to be able to do all three sections. Very very important to be able to get through all three sections. All right. So the program itself is estimated to take about 144 hours of live lessons. Uh, again, could go higher, could go lower. It just depends on how everything goes with the group. Uh, they're conducted live, as you guys know, uh, through Cisco WebEx. Each session is going to be recorded for post-class review. Or, you know, so if you can't make a particular session, you'll be able to go back and review that session later on. Or if you just simply want to go back and redo it, you know, and revisit it. Uh, each session will be conducted during the week uh, or the weekends uh, based on you guys' availability. So what I'm going to do is uh, usually the goal is to schedule the next session at the end of the previous section. So everybody knows our next meeting time is going to be this time, it's going to be this long, and we can all agree on that. Uh, if for some reason we're going to, you know, maybe I have some additional availability because, you know, I'm doing a bunch of other stuff myself, um, I might say, hey guys, uh, I have the availability to do a session on this, this time. Are you guys available? And we'll try to get a consensus on, on hosting that session. My personal goal is to host at a minimum three sessions a week. Uh, otherwise, the program will take a significant amount of time. Time is not, I'm not really concerned about the time myself. Um, I, I'm more concerned about the quality. But I also understand that you guys are looking to achieve this goal relatively quickly uh, and reasonably quickly. So we're not talking about two or three years of going through this process. So I've personally uh, kind of identified that I'd like to have uh, a minimum of three sessions a week. Um, you know, sometimes we might actually be able to do more depending on availability. Sometimes we might do less, but it might be longer sessions. Uh, but keeping in mind uh, what, what we have to cover and what our goal is, that's, that's kind of what we're trying to do. Um, like I said, it's recommended that we have at least three two-hour sessions or two three-hour sessions to be conducted weekly. Uh, that might go up, it might go down, it just depends on everybody's availability. All right, And then also sessions can be scheduled on the weekend based on you guys' availability. As each topic is covered, additional reference material which could include reading, audio, video, additional lab work. That's going to be recommended. Now, what I meant to say here is that uh, there could be some follow-on topics related to the program, uh, to, the, to the topic that we're covering at the time. But most likely, it's going to be prep material for the next topic. So I'm going to say, okay, we just finished uh, VTP version 2. The next lesson, we're going to cover VTP version 3. So there's going to be a folder in the Google Drive that's going to have, uh, be labeled for the, the topic itself based on the timeline. Go into that folder and look at that material that's in there. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to focus your guys' attention uh, on these individual topics. Uh, and I will, of course, be responsible for, for putting that material together for you, uh, which, which I think will be relevant and germane to your guys' success on the CCIE. Uh, our recommendation is that you make every effort to immerse yourself in each topic as they're covered in the live lessons. So you're not going to try and do a big prep at the end. You're going to focus your attention on each topic as we're covering those topics throughout the program. 
Uh, it is built as a mentorship program. The aim is to enable you to develop your own skills, strategies, and capability so that you are enabled to, uh, so you're enabled to tackle the next hurdle more effectively uh, with or without me, right? And that's the idea. Uh, there's some marketing stuff here. I don't have to read that. Um, it's, a, it's obviously going to be a long process. Typically, this process, uh, we've done this. This is the third time that we've gone through this particular format. Uh, the third time that we've gone through a complete format. Uh, this is the fourth time, uh, given the one that we had a false start on. But uh, it's a long process. Um, you know, CCIE, particularly the CCIE lab, it, it's not easy. And if it was easy, then everybody would do it. Uh, and every one of you are probably going to have a, you know, kind of a different experience based on your, your background and your knowledge and your understanding of these particular topics. Um, so we, we tell people it's a four to six month process. Uh, it could be longer than that. It could be shorter than that. Obviously, we can't really squeeze 150 hours of training into a month, but we don't really define the end of the program. Uh, you know, Chris, you might decide you're going to take your lab in, in five months. Uh, Ryan, you might decide you're going to take your lab in December or whatever. I'll still be available to assist you guys in that process. So I'm not expecting that everybody here is going gonna, is gonna to be prepared to take their lab at the exact same time. Uh, it is a long process. It requires a lot of personal time um, and so on. So that's, that's really important to understand. Uh, it is not a scripted process. That's what I want to make sure of as well. This is not a, a five-day boot camp or a nine-day boot camp where you just go in and you sit down with somebody for nine days and then go out and you go take your lab. We used to do that format uh, and we found that it was just, it really wasn't successful because uh, number one, it was too much material to cram into a short amount of time. It didn't give you the uh, opportunity to absorb the content and to actually truly become an expert in the content. So we found that doing this longer program made it much, much uh, more successful. Uh, all right. Um, and that's what we mean by, welcome back, Tim. Uh, that's what we mean by this, you know, this mentoring process as opposed to a boot camp. Now that doesn't mean that we won't have some sort of capstone event. My goal is to actually do that, to have some sort of capstone event where we all get together in person for four or five days or whatever, however many days we decide uh, uh, to kind of either celebrate or, or to kind of just hash out everything that you're going to expect to see in the lab. So we'll, we'll work on that as part of the process. Um, it's about building relationships too. We keep these relatively small. Uh, usually four to five people. Uh, I expect all of you guys to get to know each other very well, uh, communicate with each other outside of class time. Chris, you might have a better understanding of BGP than Ryan does, and Ryan might have a better understanding of, of OSPF than, than Mike does. Uh, so feed off each other and, and feed off your experiences uh, and work with each other, you know, either setting up your own individual sessions uh, through TeamViewer or whatever, where you guys can work on a project together or, or whatever, okay? Um, the direction is important, and I think Chris and Tim can understand that. Uh, it, it, and that's why when I, I spent the past couple of months really kind of honing the direction of this program, going through all of the topics and really kind of identifying based on the blueprint what I think is really important to succeed in this program, all right? So that's, uh, that's, that's, part of the, uh, that's part of the structure of the program itself. Uh, all right. Uh, we did base the program completely on systematically studying the blueprint. So you'll see a lot of the topics that we have uh, that are included in this, uh, in this list, in this document. Uh, and this document's going to be in the, in the Google Drive, um, is, is based on the blueprint. All right. We do have lab exercises. We do have challenges but they're not scripted. Uh, and, and I think that's really important. Uh, it, it, it really, it, it lets you learn. 
I mean, the, the lab itself is not scripted, right? So why would you script out the exercises that you're going to have in the class? Uh, you know, break fix is, is a big part of the CCIE process, okay? Now, the, that being said, uh, it generally it takes about six or seven months from start to finish. Uh, but like I said, if it takes 10 months, it takes 10 months. Now, we're going to maintain a schedule. Um, so if you individually decide that you want to take 10 months, that's certainly up to you. But we, we, we do want to try and make sure that we maintain uh, a, sted, a schedule. All right. Uh, the webinar series, that's, that's how this class is primarily constructed. Everything is done through Cisco WebEx. All of the classes are recorded. Uh, and um, the duration, like I said, anywhere from two to four hours. We may actually do an eight hour session. It is entirely possible that we could do an eight hour session. Maybe on a Saturday, everybody says, hey, I'm available, I'm available. I mean, we'll have breaks and stuff in between, but we may decide to knock out four or five different topics in a full day. I'm not saying that that's not a potential, um, but at a minimum, we're looking at about two to four hours per session, okay? Um, uh, group study is important as well. Like I said, uh, I'm not the only mentor and you guys are not the, the mentees. You're not just mentees. You guys should be mentoring each other as well. Um, all right. Uh, so some other quick hits real quick. Uh, the exam is 400 101. Uh, this is, I just pulled this from Cisco's website so you guys can go see this, but this is the, uh, the exam uh, topics for the CCIE uh, and how it's broken down. And you can see that Pretty much most of the written exam is uh, related to routing, right? 37% of the written exam is routing concepts. Uh, fundamentals of routing, RIP is covered on the written, it's not covered in the lab, EIGRP, OSPF. So these are what we consider core technologies. ISIS is on the written, but it's not in the lab. So there are some topics that you're gonna have to know about the written, but you wouldn't necessarily need to know about the lab. All right, and I'm gonna break that down a little bit too. We got a couple more things to go through. All right, uh, as far as the passing uh, uh, in the, the, uh, the written exam, it's just like any other Pearson View exam. Uh, you guys can work with me. We're, we're actually a, an authorized Pearson View testing center. So we can deliver that exam for you. Uh, you could take it. I'm out in Vir I live in Los Angeles, but I'm out in Virginia every few weeks. So I'm actually here right now doing a CCMP uh, training camp, and then I'll be in Quantico next week uh, doing a, a CCNA for the Marines. But uh, so we can schedule a time for you guys to take your exam. If you're, I know Chris and Tim, you've taken it. Uh, I might have a little bit of bad news for you about that, but we'll talk about that in a second. So during the mentorship program, we're going to be talking about all the topics that allow you to prepare for the written exam, but our primary focus is, is the lab. So on, uh, with that being said, we're going to provide you self-study materials, very conducive. Chris and Tim know all about this. Actually, Ryan, you do too. You've been through, I mean, all you do, you guys know how our VCs are. Very conducive to what you're going to see on the actual exam itself. So, uh, our goal, of course, is to get you to get that written out of the way as soon as possible. The written is, uh, exam itself is 100 questions. There are obviously no labs. Uh, you have to have an 804 to pass. Uh, the, the scoring is done on a 300 to 1,000 scale. You have 120 minutes to take the exam. Now, here's the part that I think maybe Chris and Tim are going to be a little bit disappointed about. This is a new policy. Uh, I have to find out if this applies to you guys, but it says you must take the initial attempt of the lab within 18 months, of, 18 months of passing the written. If you do not pass, you have to reattempt the lab within 12 months after your last scored attempt of your written to, re, uh, to remain valid. Um, so uh, Tim, I believe you took your written more than 18 months ago. I know, Chris, when did you take yours? Yeah, I mean, it's likely that you're going to have to retake it, right? Uh, because you're probably not going to, well, I don't know, you might, you might be able to get into the lab within 18 months, but uh, uh, this is a kind of a newer policy. Um, so 
Chris, uh, uh, Ryan, you haven't taken the written, have you? Mike, have you taken the written? No, I haven't. No, I haven't. Okay. So, I, Tim, uh, I'm assuming you're calling user four. Are you there, Tim? Yeah, I'm still here. Okay. So, we'll, we'll talk about uh, what we can do about this written. Um, uh, uh, Tim and Chris, if it ends up that I have to pay for your retake, I don't mind doing that, given the issues that we had the last go around. Um, but it might actually be kind of good to, to go through, because you guys didn't actually have the official study guide that you're going to have now, uh, to kind of go through the study guide anyway, because it's going to help you prepare for the, the, the live lessons anyway. But you and I will discuss offline how we're going to handle uh, the written portion um, you know, for, for your retake if you do have to end up retaking it. Okay. Uh, now, <clears throat> that being said, for, for Mike and Ryan and even you and Chris and Tim, you may decide that you don't want to do the written right away, right? You may decide that you want to do the written more towards the end of the program to give you more time to get not only your first attempt, but your second attempt at the CCIE lab. It, it's, it's not unlikely, uh, uh, you know, we've had people go through this program before and uh, several of them had to do the lab more than once. I'm hoping that's not the case, but realistically, I mean, the lab is not easy, right? It's not an easy thing to do. So it could take a couple of attempts. So if you take the written sooner, uh, then it may, uh, you know, put more pressure on you to jump into the lab quicker than you're, than you're ready for. So. We'll, we'll talk, I'll talk to you guys individually about what your goal is and, and about, um, you know, what you want to do about that. But that's just something that's important to understand with regard to the restrictions from Cisco. All right. So what about the lab? Because really the lab is the meat, right? The focus of the mentorship program is to prepare you for the eight hour lab exam. The CCIE lab exam is an eight hour hands on exam. It requires you to configure and troubleshoot complex networks given uh, two particular specifications. Now, I was reading that from the document, but let me explain a little bit more about that part of it because that was another experience that I had with my lab that I didn't expect. Not only does Cisco want you to configure something within the lab, but they will actually make it so that you have to configure it the way that they want you to configure it. You know, uh, when you're doing things like redistribution or you're doing, uh, you know, uh, routing configuration or whatnot, there may be multiple ways that you can accomplish that goal. Uh, here's an example I had on the version four exam. I had a scenario where they wanted me to redistribute RIP into EIGRP. Okay. Well, that's simple. I could do that. That's a CCNA level type thing. But then they said, no, no, no. We want you to redistribute RIP into EIGRP and we want you to redistribute only these particular subnets, and we want you to do it with an access list that's only two lines long. So you had to do bitwise masking and match certain bits within the, the networks themselves uh, to redistribute those particular routes a certain way, all right? Um, so not only do they want you to complete exercises but they want you to do it in a specific way and you will get points taken off or you won't get any credit because you didn't do it the way that they wanted you to do it. So that's the part that I was talking about where you can't really just go in to figure things out. You have to know this is exactly what I need to do, right? Uh, knowledge of troubleshooting is an important skill. Uh, you're expected to be able to diagnose and solve issues as part of the lab. Uh, you're not going to be configuring end user systems, but you're going to be re uh, c responsible for configuring all the devices, obviously. Um, point values and testing criteria are going to be provided to you in the lab before you start, right? So every task that you're required to accomplish is going to have a point value tied to it. You're going to know exactly what that point value is. Not all of the tasks are going to have to be configured in chronological order. So you will have the ability, in fact, especially in the troubleshooting section, the diag section is not really, uh, there's no equipment that you're doing in, in the diag section, uh, working within the diag section. But in the T-shoot and the configuration section, the, the topology is so vast because they don't want 
an issue on one part of the network to affect other parts of the network. So they're kind of individual components. So you can focus on doing one task over another task and very few of the tasks are interrelated with each other. So um, you may decide to go through the whole checklist and say, oh, I know how to do this, I know how to do this, I know how to do this, and you're gonna go ahead and do all of those particular tasks first and get those points knocked out, and then you'll go back and focus on some of the more complex ones or maybe the ones you're not as familiar with. Uh, the idea is building as, much, as many points as you need to be able to pass that particular section. We're gonna talk about what that re represents as part of this process. Uh, in the routing and switching blueprint, which I do highly recommend that you go look at, I'll go ahead and put that into the, the Google Drive for you guys. Uh, look at everything. They have a list of equipment, iOS versions and so on. I'm going to talk about that as part of our discussion here as well. The, the CCIE routing and uh, uh, switching lab, um, two hour troubleshooting section. Okay, you will have a bunch of troubleshooting tickets. The network's going to be pre-configured. You need to diagnose and resolve those problems uh, and that's a hands-on section, right? It's not, it's not like the T-shoot test for route where you're just basically answering a few questions about a particular thing. That is a really, really stressful section, all right? Uh, it's stressful for two reasons. Number one, you have to score a certain level on that. Uh, we'll talk about the scoring structure in a minute, but you have to score a certain level on that section in order to be able to even qualify and move on to the other sections. Um, the issue, okay, is that there's a counter, <laughs> believe it or not, there's actually a clock counting down and you're looking at that clock and you're, you, you have a certain number of troubleshooting tickets that you have to solve and uh, you just spent 20 or 30 minutes on one ticket, that just increases your stress level to the point where you're pretty much useless on the other tickets. So um, you, time management is an absolute critical component to uh, successfully completing this CCIE uh, lab. Very, very critical, okay? If you do happen to finish the troubleshooting section early, you are actually allowed to add additional time to the diagnostic section, which is the middle section, but it's limited. You can't if you finish the T-shoot section in an hour, you can't add an hour to the diagnostic section. I believe, and I'll verify this, but I believe the most amount of time that you're allowed to add is a half an hour. Um, but you can't, once you move on out of a section, you can't go back. Uh, let's say you finish the di diagnostic section in, in 30 minutes and you still have time for diagnostic, you can't go back to the T-shoot section. And you can't carry over any time into the configuration section, all right? The way that the lab is broken up, you go to the facility basically, everything is virtual now, so you're just sitting at a cubicle essentially. Uh, you go to the facility, the proctor's in the middle of the room, everybody is kind of facing the wall, separated in these different cubicles around the room, at least this was my experience, my last experience. You have a start time, you have a stop time. Uh, everything is automated. Uh, you know, you're basically just at a computer console. You're not, there's no real equipment anymore. Uh, and you can take breaks if you want, but it's going to count against your time. Uh, and then you break for lunch. Everybody in the group goes to eat lunch at the Cisco cafeteria with the proctor. You have to sit at a separate table. You can't talk to anybody in the cafeteria. You can't talk to any of the other candidates. Uh, and, uh, and you get marched over to the cafeteria, you get your food, you go sit down, you eat, uh, almost like a, a prison meal, uh, although the food's a little bit better. And uh, you can talk amongst yourselves at that point because the, uh, the, the uh, uh, proctor or the, uh, you know, the, your escort is sitting there with you, so you can talk to each other about non-technical stuff. But, uh, and then uh, there's a certain time you go back uh, to, the, to, the, to the classroom or the testing center and uh, you do your configuration section, all right? Um, so uh, that's the experience. Uh, it, it's, it can be a little bit stressful, all right? Um, and, uh, but, you know, it's, you have plenty of opportunity. I think somebody did the math you could take, based on Cisco's requirements and, and waiting periods between the different labs, 
that you could end up taking the lab 36 times before you're not allowed to take it anymore uh, within a particular time frame. So uh, I hope that you guys don't have to take it 36 times. But uh, somebody actually did the, the math on that based on the number of months that you have in between each time. All right. So we, we structured this program to basically increase your chances of success the first time. We're going to spend many, many months doing deep dives into each of these topics, but we're going to focus a lot of attention, like I said, on the core topics, BGP and OSPF. We're going to minimize the amount of discussion on the ancillary topics like MPLS, DMVPN, and so on. Uh, you will never pass the lab if you're not an expert in the core topics. You might be able to pass if you're not an expert in the ancillary topics. So that's really, really important, okay? Uh, our goal, and my goal personally, is to indulge your curiosity. I know you guys are here because you love to do this. You're not here because you uh, simply want the CCIE. Um, so it's all about curiosity. That's why we don't use a scripted approach to this, to this uh, program. Um, you know, we, we do everything non-scripted. Uh, I do suggest that you take notes through the process, two sets of notes, one set for the concepts, your general understanding, the theory, that kind of thing, and take a second set of notes for all of the important things. Like, oh, I was configuring OSPF and I ran into this particular issue and I used this set of commands to fix the problem. Or I, I used this debug to find the problem or whatever. So have a set of notes, uh, this is what a feasible successor is, this is what MPLS, uh, VPWS is, whatever, all the theory and the concepts, and then have a separate set of notes that, uh, that you can go back to and say, uh, the, you know, almost like on uh, your cram session notes that you would kind of review right before you go sit the lab, all right? As your test day approaches, we're gonna shift the focus uh, on the hands-on, obviously we're gonna be doing a lot of hands-on throughout the entire process, but that capstone session that we're hopefully gonna have at the end is gonna really get you into this, this mode of muscle memory performance and, and so on. Uh, there is, you do get access to the documentation CD, you get access to context-sensitive help, uh, but if you're using that stuff uh, you, you might as well pack it up because uh, your time is just gonna, gonna evaporate, all right? Um, so, uh, you know, keep a list of, of those bullet point things that you think will save that time and stuff that, oh, I, this is a core technology, these are some of the core elements, these are some of the things that I'm gonna absolutely have to know. Kind of what we call your must know list throughout the process. Uh, do your research as well. We're going to deliver the best quality training based on these blueprint topics, but you're also your own champion, right? Research the topics. Uh, you know, everybody learns differently. Everybody reacts differently in a testing environment. So it's up to you, okay? Uh, how is the, the lab exam structured? Uh, it's an eight hour long exam. Uh, there's a two hour troubleshooting section where you're troubleshooting virtual devices. Like I said, there's probably about 20 or 30 different devices in that topology. There's a diagnostic section, which is a half an hour. And I, I have to confirm this, but I'm pretty sure that if you finish T-shoot in an hour and a half, you can extend the diag section to an hour. Uh, don't quote me on that. I'm gonna go back and try to confirm that, but there are no devices in the diag section. Uh, and then, and I'll talk about why that is in a, in a minute here. And then you finally have the, the big daddy, right? The five and a half hour configuration section. The way it used to work is you'd get a big folder, a binder, uh, and you'd have a rack and you'd have to go through and accomplish all these tax, tasks in this binder. Now everything is virtual, uh, but it literally is configure spanning tree, configure ether channel, configure OSPF, etc. cetera. Uh, but you have to do it in a, in a particular way. Version five is all virtual. Um, but, and they use IOL essentially and IOU, the same instances of IOL. Uh, so that's really why the diag section is there because you do your T-shoot <laughs> and it's funny how that, why they added this, but, uh, the security is done the same way. Now 
you do your T shoot, and then after T shoot, they have to reload all the images and reload the config so that you can do your configuration section. So that's uh, why they threw that diag section in there. Um, the uh, troubleshooting section, obviously they're gonna be collecting things like the commands that you use. Uh, remember, the, the grading system in the CCIE lab is not like a, um, not like a written exam. There is some, uh, there is some flexibility in how you earn points. Uh, so it's not just like check boxes. And if you do all these check boxes, there are certain core components that you have to do, but then the person grading the exam will identify, Oh yeah, they didn't run this troubleshooting command, but they ran these commands. So that should count towards their, their score, right? So it, it's, it's not completely subjective, but there are some subjective elements to grading the lab portion. The diagnostic section is not like any of the other open-ended sections. Uh, there are specific questions. Uh, you have to troubleshoot incidents. You're not gonna have an opportunity to fix them. There's no, no command line. Uh, you basically read a scenario and you have to answer uh, specific questions about that particular scenario. Where it's kind of like uh, when you guys did the CCMP T-shoot exam uh, where you have tickets and, but even then in the T-shoot exam, at least you had command line access. In this case, you don't. So, uh, so the diagnostic section is very similar to like a written test where you might have drag and drops, you might have multiple choice options and so on. All right. No written component, computer-based scenarios. Uh, all the tickets are closed ended, which means there is absolutely a right answer. So the diagnostic section is not subjective. It's scored um, it's scored like a, like a regular exam would be scored, okay? Uh, pretty much the, the, the same topics. I mean, you're not gonna get in the diagnostic section a frame relay troubleshooting question when frame relay is not covered in the other portions of the, of the test. Um, so, uh, you know, the core topics still apply here. You don't actually, uh, have to pass the diagnostic session uh, to pass the lab exam to, uh, but it, it's, a, there are, well, I'm going to talk about the scoring elements in a minute, but uh, there are minimum scores and then there are composite scores or, or combined scores that you have to achieve in order to pass uh, the, the lab itself. Uh, there's going to be about two to four scenarios, about two questions per scenario. Each scenario comes with tons of information. Uh, that was very overwhelming when I saw that the first time. Uh, a lot of the information is irrelevant, uh, but it's there to confuse you, right? Uh, so you might get emails from a user describing the issue, which is gonna be pretty generic, but a lot of detail. You might get a diagram. So you're gonna have to be quick on your feet. You're gonna have to be able to skin through that information quickly we all could do this, right? If you guys had four or five days to do this, you would all pass, right? Um, and, and so it's not actually very conducive to uh, demonstrating your ability in the real world because you might have four or five hours to troubleshoot a particular problem. So, uh, but to be quote unquote an expert, you have to be able to do it quickly, all right? So not only do you have to be able to perform brain surgery, you just have to do it in 30 minutes instead of 30 hours. All right. So uh, two questions per scenario. Uh, can you identify where the issue is on the network? Uh, provide possible solutions or maybe the next steps and so on. Uh, and there'll be multiple choice drag and drop and so on. All right. Uh, these are all going to be based on core topics. You're probably not going to see any, well, I actually will say unequivocally, you're not going to see any tr uh, diag questions on uh, ancillary topics like MPLS or, or uh, GetVPN or something like that. Actually, GetVPN is not even really covered in the lab. Um, it's going to be the core topics. Troubleshooting OSPF, troubleshooting EIGRP, troubleshooting possibly spanning tree, something like that. You know, one of, one of the core topics. How do you pass? Uh, you have to meet two conditions to pass the lab. Uh, 
you have to exceed the minimum score on each of the three modules, which doesn't necessarily mean you passed the module, um, but there's a minimum score, okay? And your total score, the sum of the score on each of the three modules has to meet or exceed the overall lab exam cut score, okay? If you don't meet either of these criteria, you will not pass, all right? And I'm gonna walk through a scenario. The next section here, I'm, uh, uh, well, actually there's a couple of bullet points here. Um, the, the diag section, that's the smallest module, right? 30 minutes compared to five and a half hours versus two hours. If you didn't require a minimum score on that, on each section, you could pass the lab, lab without even attempting one of the sections, all right? Uh, and that's the way it kind of used to be uh, in the previous versions of the CCIE. But now they require that you achieve a minimum score on at least one of those sections, okay? Uh, and that's, that's what's required in order for you to be uh, a, um, a CCIE, okay? So let's talk about, uh, oh, uh, what should you target? As a general rule, you'll have to obtain uh, between a 40 and 60% of the points for each of the three modules to reach the minimum score and 60 to 80% of the total points to meet the overall cut score. All right. Let's assume you don't pass on your first attempt on the lab. You still be allowed to attempt to retake the exam after 30 days. Uh, if you don't pass the, the second attempt, that's where you get kind of the extended times. Now you have to wait 90 days uh, and then uh, maybe another attempt in another 90 days. But each time you do this, obviously it's gonna cost you close to $1,500, but each time you do this, that window of passing from the time you took the written continues to go down. Um, you know, but I, like I said, somebody went through and calculated mathematically within that 18 month window, uh, you know, how many times you could actually take the lab before you had to retake the written, all right? Of course, you can always retake the written and, and the whole process starts all over again, all right? The higher the score, the better. But if you get stuck in like the diag section and you can't resolve maybe one of the items, do the best you can because you're shooting for a minimum of score. Now that's like 40%, right? Um, the reason why it's a window is because you might do really, really well on the troubleshooting section, which means that goes towards your overall cut score, but you might not do so great on the diag section and might just meet the minimum requirement on the diag section, all right? So just, just keep that in mind, all right? Uh, and, and don't give up, right? If you feel like you're doing really bad on the troubleshooting section, um, you know, keep going because you might be getting more than you, than, you, than you know. At the end, when you're not gonna know what your score is by the time you're done, it's not like a written where you get your score. They typically will publish your score, you know, if maybe a few days after you're done. Uh, and then it will break down the scores that you achieved for each of the sections. So you can know if you passed, how well you did on each of the sections, or if you didn't pass, uh, what you needed to do in order to pass the next time, all right? Uh, in, uh, in, in version four, it was actually harder. You needed to achieve an 80% in both sections. Uh, so if you were really doing bad in T-Shoot, you just knew that you didn't get 80%, uh, then you basically were like, I'm just gonna play around in the config section, right? Um, so it's much, much different here. Here's a scenario, all right? These are just example numbers, they're not real numbers, but what I wanted to do is I wanted to make it clear, you know, what it would look like, okay? So let's say um, for the troubleshooting section, I, I uh, um, got a 30 and the minimum score was 15, okay? Uh, then the diag section, I got uh, a 10 and the minimum score was a four and the config section, uh, uh, excuse me, the total points, excuse me, I'm sorry. Uh, the total points 
that I could achieve in those sections is 30, 10, and 60. So that adds up to 100 points. Minimum is 15, 4, and 25, and then my cut was 23, 7, and 45. All right, so what does that mean from a passing perspective? If you look at tester number one, I got a score of 28, which met the minimum. And it was actually pretty good. I almost got a, a full 100% in that particular section, so I passed the troubleshooting section. In the diag, I did really bad. I got a two, all right? Now, the cut score was 75 out of, out of 100 for the entire lab. I got an 82. So I actually met the cut score, but I did not meet the minimum score for the diag section, which means I failed the lab, okay? It can be good, it can be bad. I mean, if you do really bad in one section, you're gonna fail even if you meet the cut score, which is a little frustrating. Um, but I think it's better, it, it's better than worse. Uh, not a really good way to say that, but I think overall it, it's gonna allow you guys to achieve your goal um, more effectively. So I just went through a couple of examples. Here's an example where you passed every section, you met the cut score for every section, I met the minimum for T-shoot, I met, just barely met the minimum for Diag, and I barely met the minimum for Config, but I failed the test because I only got 47 points of my total cut score, okay? Now these are just example numbers. I don't know specifically, I mean, it's been a while since I've done this, but uh, what the, the actual numbers are, and I don't think that's really disclosed, um, but, uh, but that's kind of how the grading structure works, okay? Um, so here's why this is good. You could do really bad in the troubleshooting section, but as long as you meet the cut score for that section, the minimum score, excuse me, for that section, you've passed that section. And then you just do really, really well on the configuration section to meet your overall cut score. Or conversely, you're kind of average in every section. So cumulatively, your overall cut score is good enough to pass the exam and you're meeting the minimums in each section. So it, it kind of balances out and I think that's a kind of a good way of, of looking at it, okay? All right, last thing we'll talk about are the 10 commandments. Uh, thou shalt manage your time. Calculate the average time you have per question. After the 25% of that length of the section, verify that you're on track do the same thing after 50% and after 75%. Always, I mean the point here is always monitor your progress. Uh, very, very important, all right? Don't get stuck on one thing, move on. If you're on a diagnostic question and it's taking you 15 minutes and you know that you've got three more diagnostic questions to go through, you need to move on because you've only got 15 minutes now to remove, to, to re I mean, you know, do you want to do really good on one question uh, to get those points, or do you want to do average on four questions to get all those points? So it, it, you have to manage that. Honor thy points. Keep in mind the point values of the questions. They are published in the, in the lab. Do not forget to allow time at the end to verify the solution. Make sure that you are still meeting those requirements. Don't make any drastic changes in the last minute of the exam and so on. All right, read everything. I know that's counterproductive or it might seem counterproductive to what you're, given that we're talking about all these different time constraints, but don't just jump in. Oh, they want me to configure OSPF. All right, I'm just gonna go ahead and start doing it because they want you to do things in a certain way. They want you to fix things in a certain way. They want you to troubleshoot things in a certain way. So it's extremely important that you do what they say not do what you think they want you to do, all right? Uh, otherwise, you won't pass. Focus on your strengths. Go through all the, the tasks are not directly related to each other, so go through all the tasks that you feel comfortable with, and then start to focus on some of the tasks that you feel less comfortable with. Consult the proctor. You are allowed to ask questions. If, uh, if it looks like a particular piece of equipment is not working correctly, uh, it does happen. I mean, these are virtual images. They could be imaged incorrectly. 
uh, you, you are allowed to ask questions and, and that, those questions get documented. So if there is some consideration as to whether or not you should have passed, you can actually bring that up during the grading process. I had a friend of mine who did a CCIE lab for wireless and he failed. And he said, well, I failed because I spent 20 minutes or 30 minutes trying to fix this problem with this adapter and the lab was broken. Well, they record these sessions. So they actually went back and reviewed that, uh, that element. And, and sure enough, they've confirmed that it was an issue with the lab and they actually passed him. Uh, they changed his score. So uh, do ask questions if you get stuck. Uh, get those points, right? Get the points. The points get awarded for every working solution. Um, it, uh, uh, most of the time the verification is just based on device outputs. Uh, it, they're not gonna look at detailed steps and all that, so get the points. Don't waste time. Uh, in the diagnostic section, read the description of the questions of each of the trouble ticket. Only check the configuration part and outputs that are necessary to, to solve the problem. This is very similar to what we saw with uh, CCMP me, with the, with the T-shoot portion. You cannot be in there doing a show run and scanning through the running config, trying to figure out what the config is and how it's represented. Uh, you, need to, you need to drill down and hone in on each section uh, specifically, right? Um, so make sure you focus your attention on that aspect. Now, now it says don't read everything, <laughs> uh, as opposed to uh, what it says in uh, commandment number, uh, uh, where was it? Uh, there was another one that said read everything, right? Um, you need to be able to, uh, to kind of paraphrase in your mind, especially in the diagnostic section, what it is that they're trying to glean, right? Uh, it's almost like speed reading. You're pulling out the important elements. They will, in that diagnostic section, put a bunch of stuff that's completely irrelevant. Uh, and they did that on the CCMP route T-shoot test as well. Uh, they either made the tickets extremely generic and reading the ticket was a complete waste of time or they put in a bunch of stuff that wasn't relevant. So, uh, you know, you have to be able to kind of pull out those elements, all right? Move your butt, all right? Speed is absolutely vital on this particular exam. Identify what your quickest way is to deploy a configuration. Could be copy and paste. You could be using the up arrow, uh, you know, using your uh, context sensitive help, using grep commands whatever it is that's going to allow you to accomplish your tasks faster is what you need to be doing, right? Use the do command instead of getting out of config mode and going back to config mode and, and use your grep commands to pull out individual debugs and shows and whatever, right? Everything that you can do to shorten the time it takes for you to accomplish a task matters because I'm telling you right now, every second matters in this lab, every single second. You're not gonna have 20 minutes to figure something out. You're not gonna have 20 minutes to parse through a bunch of the different configurations. Every single second matters, okay? So I know it took a little bit of time, actually a lot of time to kind of go through that document, but I think that really explains a, a lot of the things that, that are important, all right, in, uh, with this particular uh, program. You guys have any questions? Uh, we still have a, a, you know, about 40 minutes left, so we're going to be covering some other stuff as well. But do you have any questions about what I just covered there? Yeah, I have one quick question. I okay. Have something about being in some sort of lab. Is that through um, whatever Cisco hacks or doing like a GNS3 or EE or something like that? Everything that we do in this class, and I'm gonna talk about that next, uh, just like you did last time, Chris, is gonna be based on GNS3. We do everything ad hoc, we build everything together, we do all the configurations together uh, in GNS3. We use GNS3, uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of your other options for your own self-study, but we use GNS3 because that's essentially what you're gonna see in the actual real lab environment. Here's, uh, the Cisco builds the lab scenarios based on IOL and IOU. 
So if there's a bug in IOL or if there's a bug in IOU, uh, they're, they're not going to incorporate those elements in the configuration component of the, the lab. Now the frustrating part is if we're doing our exercises, there are going to be situations where we're going to run into, um, HSRP is a perfect example, where the, the protocols don't react the way you expect them to react or they don't act the way you expect them to act. Even though it is virtualized iOS, it doesn't perform exactly the same way as it would if you had physical equipment. But uh, because everything has moved to a virtual environment, that's pretty much what we focus, how we focus our uh, attention in, in building out um, uh, you know, the labs when we're doing our exercises. All right, um, anybody else have any questions? No? Okay. So uh, we're still in lesson number one, believe it or not, but uh, I'm going to go through and wrap up lesson number one. Um, uh, we've already covered, you know, what's going to be covered in uh, program mentorship, uh, how it's going to be covered, what you should get out of the class. We've talked about the schedule, the methodology. Uh, I, what I'm going to do uh, is um, not in this, I'm going to stop this recording pretty soon and move on to the next recording, but um, I'm going to talk to you about in the next lesson what's different between version 4 and version 5, what happened to the topology, uh, how can you guys get access to the topology. One of the things that uh, I uh, will try to, to get for you, I have one um, that's fairly old, but I see, I'll see if I can get you an updated one, uh, a, uh, a complete topology that you can work with. Uh, you know, how do you prepare for the lab? We talked about that. Uh, you know, how is the lab structured? What are your long-term goals? Uh, what, one of the things that I'm gonna be recommending as well throughout the process is what kind of books that you might wanna look at, documentation, and so on, all right? Uh, now, that being said, we talked about the fact that we were gonna use GNS3 as uh, a, co a core component of preparing for this, this lab. Uh, I'm going to suggest two things. Number one, I'm going to suggest uh, that you install TeamViewer on your computers uh, so that uh, we can certainly do sharing through WebEx, but it might be beneficial to provide remote control to assist you guys individually or in a group uh, using TeamViewer as well. So uh, I'm going to suggest that you guys install the, uh, the, the free version of TeamViewer so that uh, if there is an issue that you're running into uh, at any time, whether it's an exercise that you're working on on your own, uh, whether it's um, you know setting up something in a lab, whatever that we that I can get access to you guys and 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 do that. So uh, one of the other things that I wanted to chat with you about is the uh, is the GNS3 setup. Uh, these two documents will be provided to you in the in the drop in the Google Drive as well. Uh, how do I prepare my computer so that this is the, so that we can do the labs together, right? And this is something that you and Chris and Tim had done before, but you may end up having to do it again if uh, if you've got a new computer or whatever. So I'm going to give you guys this uh, PDF. It's I'm not going to go through it. It's a 14-page PDF, but it it talks about how to set up GNS3 with VMware. I actually have. Uh, 14 now so this is VMware 11 but uh, I have 14 available for you guys everything you need to set this up is in this folder here tinyurl.com slash think tank software um, we're using these specific builds the only difference is we're using VMware 14 instead of 11 um, but we're using these specific builds um, there are newer versions of GNS3 uh, it's not really necessary for what we're trying to do. Um, if I do find that there's some additional features in some of the newer versions of GNS3, we might uh, move on to those versions and, and work with that. So uh, for, for you, Mike and Ryan, and, and maybe even Chris and Tim, uh, I would suggest that you, before our next lesson, that you go through this, make sure it's set up, don't do it the, the last day. 2.12 might work. Uh, the main line, Chris, main thing, Chris, is to make sure that you got the OVAs, uh, the, the GNS3 OVA loaded, and you can do IOU and IOL images, right? That's the main thing. 
Um, so you guys could be using newer versions as long as you can load up the IOU images for switching because that's what our focus is going to be on initially is all the switching topics. All right, so you guys will go through this document and that'll get you set up. For the routing piece, it's a little simpler. On the routing side, you don't really need to, uh, to use IOU. We can just use iOS images. So there's going to be another document. This is the one we use for CCMP route. Uh, and we use specifically a 7200 image. And that's actually recommended because it's 15.2. And 15.2 is the iOS image that Cisco uses in their topology. And I think they even use 7200s in their topology for, for the virtual lab in their environment. So this will be another document you're going to want to go through. Uh, this is the second document. You want to do the first one first. Uh, get everything working and then you can just add this this platform. Uh, I'll be providing you guys the images that are necessary to run and uh, and then what we'll be doing as part of the process moving forward is we'll be using these documents to to uh, are these uh, configurations to do our lab exercises. Now that being said, if you guys have recommendations or you have uh, maybe a different approach, uh, maybe you're, you're using different tools that you find very, very useful. Recommend them to me, and we'll see if we can integrate them into our discussions. Remember, this is not a scripted class, so we have, uh, you know, lots and lots of options, okay? All right, so we've talked about the class. We talked about a mix of technology, explanations versus live examples. Uh, we learn better by not using a pre-scripted option. Uh, you know, what happens if I break something and how do I fix it and so on. And I might even do that when I'm doing demonstrations. I might be going through something and saying, man, this is not working. Why isn't this working? And it could be related to GNS3 or it could be simply um, that I need to troubleshoot. So you're going to see how, what kind of methodologies I might use to troubleshoot something as well as an expert level engineer. Okay. What are the prerequisites for this class? Uh, not much. Basic layer two and layer three understanding, things like QoS, iOS security, iOS operation, et cetera. But you do not need to be an expert, right? That's obviously why you guys are here to become an expert. Um, and uh, so there's gonna be a lot of reading between the lessons, a lot of preparation for the next lesson and so on. My objective, of course, is to make sure that I'm providing you the information that's needed to be able to do that. Okay, all right. Uh, I may even give you guys some videos from uh, different resources. Maybe it's a YouTube link. Uh, this is a, this guy explains this topic really, really well. Go watch it. Or uh, I might upload a video to the Google Drive from you know some other source and say, hey, this is uh, relevant to our next discussion. Go watch this video. All right. I know it's not maybe easy to learn that way. Otherwise, that's what you guys would be doing anyway but it's all about adding additional resources to ensure your success, okay? So that actually concludes our first lesson. Let me go ahead and stop the recording and then we'll jump into the next lesson, uh, uh, which is lesson.